All right. Um, so uh, Arian ten tendencies, both Milton and the younger C.S. Lewis uh, read hierarchy into the Trinity, but by the time he writes the discarded image, he, um, he, he rejects that. And by the way, just to give you an, an up-to-date up, up uh, reference here, Lewis as a Neoplatonist is, is criticized uh, you know, fairly, quite fairly, I think, and astutely, but kindly, uh, by N.T. Wright in his uh, book, Simply Christian. N.T. Wright was the canon theologian at, uh, at Westminster Abbey, now is the Bishop of Durham in England, and like me, uh, he, he got a lot out of C.S. Lewis as a young intellect uh, when he was, was younger, but, he's, but, he is, he, but he does not simply treat Lewis as if you know, Lewis was the 13th apostle. There are, by the way, 200 C.S. Lewis societies over the world, and most of them, unfortunately, do try to treat C.S. Lewis as if he's the 13th apostle, all right? As if somehow, you know, if Lewis, Lewis said this is merely Christian, everything he said that was merely Christian is merely Christian. Now, that's too big a burden for any human being to bear, okay? They are not doing Lewis a favor, and Lewis, I don't think, would, would appreciate their doing that. Okay, so here's some earlier works. I need to watch because, because on, uh, there's no clock back there, or I can't see it. 1023, okay, oh, we're doing fine. All right, thanks, Ray. Um, uh, I've already talked about his space trilogy. I haven't got um, uh, out of the, the silent planet there, uh, because it's the masculine planet, and there's not a single woman in that story at all, right? Uh, but in Paralander and that hideous strength, he's certainly um, talking, arguing for gender archetypes, that is gender essences, metaphysical gender essences and gender hierarchy. Um, he certainly does it in Mere Christianity, for those of you who are taking IST 150. Um, uh, and, and he does it to a degree in The Four Loves, but this is the book where he starts to, to, to speak in two different voices. Let's look at some significant quotations. This is from Paralandra. Um, uh, Lewis uh, 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 says there, our ancestors did not make mountains masculine because they projected male characteristics onto them. The process is the reverse. Gender is a reality and a more fundamental reality than sex. Sex, in fact, is merely the adaptation to organic life of a fundamental polarity which divides all created beings. Feminine, female sex is merely one of the things that have feminine gender. There are many others. Masculine and feminine meet us on a plane of reality where male and female would simply be meaningless. Masculine is not attenuated male, nor feminine attenuated female. On the contrary, the male and female of organic, flesh and blood creatures, are rather faint and blurred reflections, shadowy, shadowlands reflections of that spiritual reality of masculine and feminine. Here is uh, from That Hideous Strength. Um, this is Ransom still talking to Jane Studdock, and she's, she's comparing him to the wife of one of her professors, Mrs. Dimble, who has no children of her own, but she, she, she uh, uh, uses her nurturant tendencies to sort of mother the, 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 the pupils of her, her husband, including Jane, who's writing her dissertation under this Professor Dimble. Uh, and he's still saying, he, what he's saying to her is, look, you shouldn't be so busy writing your dissertation, all right? At the end of the book, he says, uh, have babies instead, okay, all right? She's been having very troubled dreams, that's why she comes. He says, you'll have, no, you'll have no more dreams of that sort, have babies instead. And here's how he explains it. He says, look, a virginal rejection of the male, all right, the way you're rejecting your, well, you're rejecting your husband, but you're not doing it as a virgin. A virginal rejection of the male, he, that is God, would allow. Such feminine souls, like nuns, for example, can bypass the male and go on to meet something far more masculine higher up, to which they must make an even greater surrender. But Mother Dimble, the wife of your, your, your professor, is a Christian wife, and you, you know, are not, and neither are you a virgin. So I'm afraid there's no niche in the world for people who won't be either pagan or Christian. All right? Now, one of C.S. Lewis's biggest fans, and the person in America who wrote his, uh, his, the first biography of him, Chad Walsh, actually says of Lewis, you know, it is possible that God can count beyond two, okay? <laughs> Lewis was very, very, used disjunction a lot as a rhetorical strategy, all right? Either this or this, and there's no third way. There's no third way. Okay, so we have an example of that here. All right, uh, uh, this is from his, um, his, his, his essay called Membership. Uh, I do not believe God created an egalitarian world. I believe the authority of parent over child, husband over wife, learned over simple, to have been a, as much a part of the original plan as the authority of man over beast. I believe that we would not, if we had not fallen, Patriarchal monarchy would be the sole lawful form of government. I actually like saying this to American audiences because conservative Christians love the patriarchal part. They don't like the monarchy part, right? Isn't, isn't, that, what we got rid, isn't that what we got rid of in the American Revolution? Okay, 
but, Lewis continues, since we have learned sin, the only remedy has been to take away the powers and substitute the legal fiction of equality. Equality for me is in the same position as close. It is the result of the fall and a remedy for it. But it is the hierarchical world, still alive and very properly, hidden behind a facade of equal citizenship. Right? So Lewis does believe in gender equality in the public sphere. Right? He supports women's, the vote for women. He supports the Married Women's Property Act. It used to be that married women couldn't own any of their own property until sometime during the Edwardian age. Lewis supports the Married Women's Property Act. But he says it's a hierarchical world still alive and very properly hidden behind, behind a facade of equal citizenship, which is our real concern here. As democracy becomes more complete in the outer world, the public world, and opportunities for reverence are successively removed, the refreshment, the cleansing, and invigorating returns to inequality, which the church offers us, become more and more necessary. More and more necessary, he says. Okay, so he, he sees there's sort of a compromise here. Yes, he says, I realize in the public world we must have this fiction of equal citizenship, but it's not to be that way in the church. Not if you're a Christian. Not if you're a mere Christian, okay? As he sees it. Um, this is from mere Christianity. The relations of the family to the outer world, he says, in the chapter on marriage, um, what it might be called its foreign policy toward the outer world, must depend in the last resort upon the man because he always ought to be and usually is much more just to outsiders. Echoes of Aristotle, right? Remember? Women are not as rational as men and therefore they are not as just as men, as moral as men. A woman is primarily fighting for her own children against the rest of the world and she is the special trustee of their interests so he, he wants to give women an honored place in the domestic sphere. That's her job. Okay. The function of the husband is to see that this natural preference is not given its head. In other words, it doesn't go too far. So he has the last word in order to, to, to protect other people from the ten, intense family patriotism of the wife. Right? But what Lewis is saying here is what many sociologists of the time said too, that women have what are called particularistic loyalties. It's going to be my son, right or wrong. Even if my son bit the neighbor's child, I'm going to defend my son no matter what. You know, it's the father who's going to come in and say, now, wait a minute, who started this fight? <laughs> right, 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 right. Who's, you know, oh, my son started the fight? Up to your room, I'll deal with you later. Oh, dear, don't do that. That's your son. You know, that's why Lewis said, and then he actually gives that example. You know, if, you're, if your son bit the neighbor's dog or if the neighbor's dog bit your son, who would you rather have deal with it, the husband or the wife uh, in the situation? He gives that example in mere Christianity uh, in the context of this. Here's a final quote. This is from The Four Loves. And remember I said in The Four Loves he actually goes both ways, right? In terms of gender essentialism, gender is a more social construct. But here he's talking, uh, he's talking his gender essentialist side. In the act of love, that is the sexual act, we are not merely ourselves. In us, all the, all the masculinity and femininity of the world, all that is assailant on the male side, responsive on the female side, are momentarily focused. The man does play sky father and the, earth, and the woman earth mother. He does play form and she matter. Now I underline that, not because Lewis did, but because sky father, earth mother is in pagan mythology, right? Okay? And man is form and woman is matter. You know who this comes from? Anybody in THC? Straight from Aristotle. Thank you, Eliza. Right? Straight from Aristotle. Um, you know, man provides the, the, all the, what we, today we would call the genetic material for, for the child, whether it's male or female. The woman is merely the, the soil, the womb is merely the soil in which the man's form um, develops in the matter of the womb, right? He does play form, she does play matter. Now, he pulls his punches. A woman who literally accepted this um, uh, extreme self-surrender would be an idolatrous, offend, offering to man what offers, belongs only to God. And a man would have to be the coxcomb of all coxcombs, and indeed a blasphemer, if he arrogated to himself, as the mere person he is, the sort of sovereignty to which Venus, for a moment, exalts him. But what, what cannot lawfully be yielded or claimed can be lawfully enacted. Outside this domestic, private uh, ritual or drama, he and she are two immortal souls, two freeborn adults, two citizens. But, not just in church, but in marriage, and within marriage, in the sexual rite, Within this writer drama, they become a god and a goddess between whom there is no equality, whose relations are asymmetrical. Okay? So whatever you, know, whatever you say about equality and equal citizenship, it's not to happen in the church, and it's not to happen um, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in marriage, at least if you are a Christian, according to Lewis. <laughs>